you said philosophy in, as a study is one of the most important necessary studies. Mm. Why did you say that? Well, uh, that's a very good question, and I know that this question will, the answer I will give uh, might uh, raise a lot of controversy, right? Now, in the past, and when I say the past, I mean until 100 years ago, it would have gone by itself, uh, like the French say, that philosophy is the queen of the sciences. Mm. I mean, 100 years ago, physics was still called natural philosophy. Uh, which means that it was a branch of philosophy, right? And it has been like that for time immemorial. In the past hundred years, the various disciplines have claimed independence, so to say, from philosophy and from history. So why do I keep thinking that philosophy is the most important of all disciplines? Because it's the only discipline that doesn't have a specific object of uh, investigation, but instead uh, has as its goal the reflection by the human being on whichever activity the human being is involved in. So, for example, someone who does history, hmm? he does history and he follows a certain methodology, which is the methodology of uh, historiography and so on and so forth. In doing so, he starts from certain unspoken, unreflected upon assumptions, premises. Well, philosophy is that thing, that way of thinking, that, uh, that uh, way of organizing thought that forces you to reflect on these assumptions, on these unreflected upon premises same thing can be said about all other disciplines. In other words, philosophy is that um, uh, practice of thinking whereby you ask why do I do what I do? Why do I start from, from this premise in doing what I do? What if this premise is incomplete, misleading, false, uh, and so on and so forth? So, philosophy is the um, uh, the activity again, rather than discipline, I would call it activity, that enwraps all other particular disciplines and, uh, and activities. That's why I think it's the queen of, of all disciplines. Amazing. Thank you. My name is Paolo Di Leo. Uh, I work on philosophy. I've been doing that consistently in the past 10 years. Uh, previously, I was trained as a philologist, which is a term that I know most people don't know, uh, someone who studies texts, basically, and particularly classical philology in my case, so uh, ancient Greek and Latin. I did that because I wanted to uh, become able uh, to master, above all the ancient Greek language, to such a level as to read the ancient philosophers in their primary original texts. It took me some, ti some time, but eventually I did it. And then since I've been here in Singapore, which has been, as I said, for the past 10 years, I have been teaching mostly philosophy, sometimes history, but philosophy is really my uh, area of focus. Can I say you're a master in philosophy? I wouldn't say a master because nobody is a master in philosophy. Uh, if one takes the word philosophy at its face value, that is a lover of wisdom, right? Now, uh, any lover never really fully conquers the object of love. So, uh, well, Hegel thought that uh, he finally had reached a full conquest of uh, the object of love, but I think that's a bit pretentious. So I stay rather with Socrates in thinking that the philosopher is a lover that is always pursuing his object of love. So I don't think anybody can achieve mastery in this field. Yeah. How, how long have you been like, learning and in pursuit of philosophy or in the learning of, or in the practice of philosophy? Well, the preparatory study, uh, the preparatory Yes, it been since I was in high school until the end of my PhD, so say all in all some 12, 13 years or 15. 
the years instead in which I concentrated on studying philosophy proper and teaching it and uh, writing on it have been 10, 10, 11. Okay, and why are you? Why do you want to start a social media channel? Well, uh, that's a good question. Uh, now I've noticed that out there there are many channels that focus on uh, things that have to do with academic topics, with theoretical topics. So um, you have channels on physics, a lot of channels on history, which is very good, and I hope they keep multiplying and they keep getting better and better but I've noticed that at least in my experience I might be wrong but in my experience on YouTube and on the social media I don't find much on philosophy proper so I think that that gap needs to be filled and uh, I think so because I deem philosophy above all today together with history and perhaps even more than history the most necessary discipline uh, to be known, to be practiced, in order to navigate the world in which we live. So that's my uh, reason for doing this. To, uh, if I were to use a, a slogan almost, to bring philosophy back into the agora, into the public square, where it started from. Tell me about the history of philosophy. History of philosophy. Well, the topic itself, as I was uh, hinting at before, is a bit controversial. Um, it's controversial because it depends on what you understand the goal of the history of philosophy to be. If we start from the current state of affairs, mostly history of philosophy has become a sort of uh, uh, recording of what various people throughout the, the course of history, of uh, the developing of centuries, have said. Well, at that point, the history of philosophy ends up being a sort of, I'll use a, a difficult word, doxography, that is to say, a writing about opinions. Plato thought this, Aristotle thought that, then came along, I don't know, St. Augustine who thought something else. Of course, any reasonable person would ask, why should I care about the opinion of this and that? So if the history of philosophy ends up being a recording of opinions, a doxography, why to do it is quite irrelevant. And unfortunately, as I said, this is the state of affairs. Uh, in mo most academic uh, institutions. There is another way, though, to think of the history of philosophy. The history of philosophy as the reflection of philosophy on itself. Now, philosophy is always someone that philosophizes. There is no philosophy floating in the air per se. There is someone who thinks. Because in the end, Philosophy is a, is a certain way of thinking, a certain way of organizing thought. This someone who thinks doesn't think in the void. He thinks, first of all, starting from a situation in which he or she lives, which is his or her time, right? And is not the first one to think. There have been other people who have been thinking in that particular way that we call philosophy, within that particular frame of thought that we call philosophy. Hence, the history of philosophy, when it is done properly, is the um, approach to the thought of others that have lived before us and have thought before us, done by someone who is thinking now, who is now engaging him or herself with his, her reality with the same questions that those thinkers who lived before us have engaged with. History of philosophy done this way is a, a direct involvement with reality in its historical dimension. And once one does this, one realizes that 
the past is not gone, that the questions that have been raised back then are still active today. One could say that the, fundamentally they are the same questions. To give you an example, I mean, this is coming just, uh, I didn't program this, but it's coming out. I have this book in front of me, well, I might very well show it. There is no advertisement here because it's an old book. Uh, this is Thomas More's Utopia. Uh, Thomas More was a humanist and um, a philosopher in a certain way who lived in the 1500s in England. He was Lord Chancellor under Henry VIII. So he, he was someone of uh, importance, so to say, right? And he wrote this book called Utopia. It's a book um, in which he tackles with one question. What is the perfect kind of society? Which is the perfect model for us human beings to organize our living together? Now, this question that he posed 500 years ago had been already posed 1,000 years before him and had been posed again and again and again. This is an example of how these questions posed in the past are still active today and are still the same. So, history of philosophy done this way is the correct way. And when done this way, it allows one to do what I was saying in the beginning, that is to say, become conscious of his or her own existence as a historical being in the time in which one lives, and hence being able to critically read events, to critically read happenings, and whatever goes on around one. Do you have any maybe specific examples of um, maybe a train of thought where because we used philosophical, um, because we used uh, the practice of philosophy, we came up with new ideas mm. that if we hadn't looked at the foundations, if we hadn't looked at the reflections, we would not have come up with. Mm. Well, uh, one could go back to the beginning of philosophy. And the beginning of philosophy um, is in Greece, uh, ancient Greece. So we're talking about 600 years before Christ. If one were to choose an example, um, one could uh, think, for example, of Socrates. What did Socrates do? He went around the public square, the Agora, uh, talking to people. And what was he doing while talking to them? He was asking them to uh, explain to him what they were doing. So he would do the same thing with a worker, with a manual worker, or with someone like, for example, Alci Alcibiades, Alcibiades in Greek, uh, who was a young man member of one of the most aristocratic families in Athens and who had aspirations to become leader of the Athenian community. So he would ask him, you say you want to become the leader of the Athenian community and uh, that's great, uh, fantastic. Now, what does being a leader mean? What does community mean? So it would force him, in this case I'll, I'll severe this, but as I said, he did the same with uh, all the people he ran into, to give um, reasons, to, to, um, to explain clearly what they understood the thing they were engaged in to be. With, in the case of Alcibiades, for example, in a famous dialogue called Alcibiades, um, Alcibiades gives him the answer, well, being a leader means having virtue. Then Socrates asks, well, what is virtue then? Right? You should know. If you want to be a leader, it means that you already have virtue. If you have it, you must know what it is. So can you please tell me? By the end of the dialogue, it's clear that Alcibiades doesn't know what virtue is. Does Plato, who's the writer of the dialogue, give us an answer about what virtue is in the dialogue? No. So the first acquisition in this kind of practice is that we know that we don't know. We come to the clear knowledge that we don't know what, we, in fact, we thought we knew. Okay? And this is 
the first important, perhaps the most important step, the most important passage in the doing of philosophy, becoming aware of our fundamental ignorance about the things that we assume we know. It is very well known that Socrates considered himself to be, well, was declared by uh, the god of Delphi uh, to be uh, the, the wisest man. And uh, Socrates was baffled by, by this declaration of the oracle. When he uh, sent uh, a friend to Delphi to ask why the god had said such a thing, the answer he got was that uh, he was the wisest man because he knew that he didn't know. So, this is, I think, the first most important thing that philosophy does. Because this, um, this awareness of our ignorance is transformative, is in a way revolutionary. That is to say, once we realize that, okay, we've been doing this, but in fact, we don't know why we're doing that. We, we have no justification, uh, no foundation for what we've been doing so far. Well, at that point, we put into question the whole thing. We're forced to look at it again. And by doing so, we are forced to go ahead. That is to say, to, in a certain way, progress. I use this word in, in a light sense, not in, in a heavy sense of progress. And, uh, but, you know, take a step forward. That's the first uh, thing. But uh, there are uh, other things that um, philosophy has contributed from the start. For example, a certain new way to look at reality. Um, a good example about this is a word that we all use today and we assume uh, that is a word that is um, self-evident, clear, it needs no explanation. The word nature. Actually, the word nature is one of the most ambiguous, difficult words to understand. When did it emerge as a word and hence as a concept? Through the first Greek philosophers. The word nature the, that we use today in English is uh, nothing but the um, the derivation of the, the Latin word natura, which in its turn is the translation of the Greek word physis. Physis out of which physics comes. Now, natura, the, the Latin word natura says literally things that keep being born. So what is nature? Things that keep being born, things that keep coming up. And in this sense, it's a good translation, literal translation, of the word thesis, of the Greek word thesis. Thing, things that keep coming up by themselves. By themselves. When did this word thesis emerge first? It emerged with the early Greek philosophers, the so called pre Socratics, to use a jargon that uh, is common. Before them, this word didn't exist in Greek. With the emergence of this word, a certain way of looking at things has started. If you look at things as something that, if you look at the totality of things as things that keep emerging, that keep coming up out of themselves, then the question is, how? Not who made it, but how. Because you are already assuming, you are already saying that they come up by themselves. How? Then the question becomes that of trying to see whether there is a mechanism whereby this keeps happening. That's the first stone which will lead to what we call today physics. That is to say, the study of things around us as determined by certain laws. 
but this is a philosophical idea. And this philosophical idea has determined a way to look at things that has characterized an entire civilization, the so-called European civilization, for 2,000 plus years. To give you an idea how not uh, granted, uh, how, uh, in a way, uh, human-made the notion of nature is, one needs only to think of the fact that in Chinese, for example, I've been told, the word nature per se didn't exist. In Chinese, the word nature starts being there as a translation from Japanese of this word that the Japanese themselves had taken from the Europeans in the 19th century. But again, even more, without going to, to China, I said before that the word nature comes from the Latin natura, and natura is a coinage, literally a word that has been invent invented by Latin people in order to translate this Greek word thesis. And again, the Greek word itself, before a certain time, didn't exist. It was invented by the early pre-Socratic philosophers. This is to say what? This is to say that what philosophy does, and has done and keeps doing when it's done properly, it creates concepts. And these concepts, in turn, have the power to change the way in which we look at things. What does the normal person think when they say the word nature? The, the normal person? Yeah. Well, uh, usually, I mean, I've asked this question, first of all, to myself. Because when I started reflecting on this years ago, it took me time to, to unpack what I think, what I understand under the word nature. Then I've been asking my students, people I know, my friends, mostly when we say nature, we um, think, without knowing it, without being fully aware of it, of mainly three things. One, the most immediate thing, is things around us like trees, animals, uh, insects, whatever, right? I mean, whatever is not man-made, so to say. Uh, we think of that. And that's the most common usage of the word nature. Then, when pressed, uh, we notice that um, we use this word also to say someone's or something's uh, character. The character of something, the, the inner core of something or someone, for example, in the expression, oh, uh, he does that by nature, or it comes natural to him, or you are, an, you are a natural, right? Meaning that you have it in you. It's what you are. You are so good at this because that's what you are. Mm? Which tells us something already, though. Namely that by nature, we understand the fundamental trait of something, that is the core of something. When we keep digging there, there comes out uh, the, how shall I say, the um, specific definition of nature, of the word nature, uh, which is that of something arranged by certain laws. Because the character of someone or something is organized and reappears according to patterns. If it is organized and reappears according to patterns, it must be governed by some kind of law. And that's the fundamental assumption of all of um, Western philosophy, which then has been uh, the guiding principle of the development of physics. So, the other way, the other fundamental way in which we think of nature is as the uh, result of the so-called laws of nature. Mm. That's what the, the common man, the common person, usually thinks, again, even though he or she is not aware of it. Mm. This brings me to another theme, I will touch it quickly. Now. I said before that the common person 
is unaware that when he or she says nature, he or she understands all the things that I said. This happens in all languages, and this points to another important phenomenon. The fact that although we think that we use language, in reality we live in language, and oftentimes, more often than not, it is language that speaks through us. Let me say this again. It is language that speaks through us. We don't use language. We are, in a way, spoken by language. So one thing that philosophy does is also to uh, force us to look at the uh, first um, depository, so to say, of assumptions that is language itself. And when philosophy is done properly, it uh, brings out the um, uh, implications, the semantic implications of keywords, of important words. I see. Um, it's, it's sort of a simple question, because I mean, when you're saying how people think of the word nature, there's a progression from uh, trees and animals to the core of something, then to the laws. Mm -hmm. The difference, sorry, the jump between the core of something to the laws that follow it is because you see a pattern in some way. Yeah, yeah. Can you see me an example or, or, of like a pattern? Well, for example, um, the first thing that, if we go back to the Greek philosophers, the, the, the first ones who came up with the word thesis, right? They realized that in all that they saw around them, there was some kind of rhythm, some kind of regularity they understood this kind of regularity as somehow based on uh, um, recurrent relations. And the word they use for this is logos. This is another key word of uh, Western thought in general, Western tradition in general, pretty much like Tao is a key word of the Chinese tra tradition. Um, the question then became, can we investigate these relations and how do they work precisely? What are these recurrent relations? Well, for example, the fact that uh, uh, seasons follow each other with a certain order. Or the fact, for example, that um, vegetables of a certain type tend, not tend, but uh, behave, so to say, grow and decay always in the same way. Or uh, the very rhythm that, uh, that um, governs, so to say, uh, the, 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 the growth of uh, a living uh, sentient body, like the human body or the, 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 or the dog or uh, whatever, right? And then, of course, the, the cycle of the sky, I say the sky on purpose, not the universe, because there's no notion yet of universe, right? But the movement of the sky that uh, we see, we, we don't see it anymore because we have light pollution, but back in the day you could see it, the movement of the sky above your head, you notice that stars move in a certain regular order and they reappear at the same place every season, so to say. The, the, the movement again of the sun uh, through the sky, uh, the relation of the sun with the moon again in the sky, and the relation of the movements of the moon with certain observable phenomena down here on Earth. All this is the ensemble of patterns that can be observed. Now, this is something that all human beings have observed, all human civilizations, right? This is nothing uh, typically Greek, so to say. What is typically Greek is the fact that they understood these things as governed by certain laws, by certain hidden laws. That is to say, they saw the phenomenon. They saw that the phenomena reappeared with a certain order. They wondered 
what is the governing principle of this order. So we see the logos. What is the governing principle of the logos? What's the name for governing principle in Greek? Archi. Archi means the beginning on the one hand, but beginning understood as the governing principle. That is to say, what gives birth and then keeps governing the thing as the thing unfolds. This is uh, an example and uh, an explanation of why when we think of patterns we are immediately thinking, if we think in a Western way, of governing laws. I think we can go on to the last question, mm -hmm. which is what is philosophy? Um, what is philosophy? Yes. Uh, well, that's also a very loaded question, right? So philosophy has been explained in many ways and that's because as i said before philosophy doesn't have a single object of investigation that is to say if you do physics your object of investigation is physical phenomena huh? understood with certain presuppositions looked at uh, through a geometrical, geometrical mathematical frame, right? Th that's what physics does. If you do biology, your field of investigation is life, living things, things that live. And um, you, you approach these things with, again, from within a certain frame, which is that of chemistry. We can go on and on and on. And... Uh, History. If you do history, you start from the assumption that history is the um, uh, recovering of uh, the past, the reconstruction of things that have happened in the past, uh, the causes of the present situation, by looking at documents which have to be uh, uh, arranged according to their credibility and so on and so forth. When you do philosophy, what is it that you do? As I said before, is that activity that forces you to reflect on whatever you're doing. So, in a way, the philosopher, the real philosopher, is um, a sort of um, master of nothing, so to say. Um, and that's why it is difficult to define philosophy. And that's why philosophy has received, has received many definitions. Now, if we stay at what the word said, as noticed before, philosophy means love of wisdom. We could reflect on this uh, name, love of wisdom, by um, asking what wisdom means. Sophia in Greek, sophos. The sophos in Greek is someone who's truly able to go through life, truly able to handle something in the proper way. That's what a sophos is. That is to say, it's not someone who has some kind of uh, arcane knowledge of things. No, it's someone who knows how to be fully present to things. That's a sophos. So, philosophia then, love of wisdom, is the love of a certain way of being which must be achieved. A way of being whereby we are fully present to what we do, fully present to ourselves and to things. That's already good enough. But, you know, in the course of uh, history, as I said, philosophy has, has received many definitions, so to say. One is uh, that given by Plato uh, in, um, in the dialogue called uh, Phidon, uh, in which he accounts for the last few hours of life of uh, Socrates, before Socrates drank the hemlock. And uh, there, uh, philosophy is called, um, uh, shall I say, practice, mm, uh, practice of death doesn't mean that you have to kill yourself or that you have to think about death. Practice of death means uh, the kind of practice that is possible 
because of death. That is to say, because of that phenomenon whereby the soul gets separated from the body. If you believe, like uh, Plato believed, like Plato thought, that the soul is something per se living and immortal, and it animates a body, but the two can be detached, and the soul, in fact, can operate much better at its uh, rational abilities when it's not bothered by the body and its passions and its needs and so on and so forth, then death, which is that phenomenon whereby the soul gets separated from the body, allows the soul to finally operate as it can at uh, the utmost of its potentials, so to say, which are, which are for Plato the rational ones. That's a definition, so meditation of death. A definition that is uh, practice of death. A, a definition that is very successful because then it was used by the Stoics, even though its meaning was changed by the Stoics. As say, the Stoics said, "We don't know whether the soul is immortal and it survives the body. Probably doesn't." So, but yet philosophy is meditation of death, is practice of death. In which sense? In the sense that if we want to be fully humans, we must face this, which is the main problem for us, that is the fact that we die, our mortality. At that point, we have to take charge of our own finitude, of our own mortality. These are the Stoics. Uh, a philosopher that I uh, love enormously, whose name is Montaigne, followed this way of thinking, this, this uh, way of understanding uh, philosophy as uh, practice of death. After him, this, this concentration on the phenomenon of death as the, as the main thing that philosophy uh, does has continued. It comes down even to, uh, to the 20th century, Heidegger, the, the so-called existentialists, and, uh, and so on and so forth. That's one way. Another possible uh, definition of philosophy is that of um, uh, the, um, as Hegel puts it, philosophy is uh, our time apprehended in knowledge. That is to say, what is philosophy? Philosophy is the practice whereby we become fully aware of the time in which we live, and by doing this, we become fully aware of where this time comes from, of where our situation comes from. So, our time apprehended in knowledge. And in that sense, philosophy is tightly linked to history. Another understanding of philosophy is that of providing a, um, a general frame in which to understand what the human being is. Uh, that's something that uh, several philosophers have focused on. One is Montaigne, for example, that I named before. Uh, you have the Italian Vico, Gian Battista Vico. Uh, later on, you'll have uh, Heidegger, who wants to give a fundamental ontology based on uh, a starting point, which is the reflection on the human phenomenon per se. Um, then you have yet another way um, of defining philosophy as um, the frame whereby we could establish a total rationality which would then work as the foundation for the building of a secure knowledge, of, of a knowledge that is certain of itself because certain of the foundations on which it rests. And this way of understanding philosophy is the one that is at the um, foundation of all the modern sciences. It was made explicit in the form in which it is still active by Descartes, by uh, René Descartes. And 
has been the fuel of uh, modern thinking since Descartes. So thinkers like Kant, like Hegel, are on this trajectory in a certain way. I see, okay. Um, when you said the definition of philosophy being our time apprehended in knowledge, mm. was that Montan's? Mon uh, no, Hegel. Yeah, Hegel, okay. Can you, I, I have difficulty understanding what this phrase means. Yeah, it's a difficult phrase. First of all, this phrase says that philosophy can be authentic, can be real, only when it is practiced in connection with history, first. And this is a very important point, because it's a point that I think, but we can talk about this another time, is today completely obliterated. Philosophy is authentic when it's done in connection with history. That is to say, when it helps you to understand precisely the situation in which you are living today. That is to say, what are the cultural premises that beset the current affairs? We come from somewhere, and this somewhere determines the time where we come from, which is in the past, determines our present. As I say, our present is the last, um, the last um, sprout, so to say, of a long trajectory that is behind us. That is behind us, as a way of saying, because it is in fact ahead of us. Hmm? So philosophy is the thing that allow, allows you to apprehend your moment now but it allows you to do that because it allows you to apprehend where you come from that's what that sentence means now if we want to dig a bit more but again this is a topic for a long discussion uh, there is a not a paradox but a point of problem there the moment you apprehend your present, your present is already past, is already gone ahead, and then you have to catch up. And, and that's why Hegel says that philosophy is like uh, uh, the howl of the goddess Minerva. It arrives late. So it has always to catch up. Mm. Uh, it sees, but it sees in the dark. And uh, um, it can shed light only to a certain extent. What operates under is the mold of history, mold the, the animal, right? The animal that uh, digs uh, under the earth, right? History understood as the, the making of things by the human beings operates in the dark. Philosophy is, is that thing that necessarily arrives late and arrives when the, the mold has already progressed in the dark mm. so that's what that sentence means in short because as i said here we could uh, spend hours to to to, uh, to explain that sentence mm. previously in the, in the the dinner talk that you mentioned there was a definition you gave for philosophy being somewhat related to freedom because mm. in meditation of death death is the greatest freedom and there's a beautiful phrase you said which is when you choose to die i mean not to encourage suicide but when you choose to die you challenge the gods oh, mm. why, why did you say that well, how, how's that well there i was repeating what seneca says so before i said that uh, the ones who mm, uh, 
took the definition of philosophy as uh, practice of death are the Stoics, right? The, the first ones. And as I said, they take it a different way from Plato, right? They say, well, we don't know about survival of the, of the soul after death. We don't know that. We know that we die, okay? So let's stay at that. Uh, now, what the Stoics noticed is that First of all, there is an order in, in all things that governs all things that governs governs nature, right? There is a general order, and this order is divine because it's self-sustained and uh, is eternal, and so on and so forth. The human being, though, within this order, is subjected to what Seneca calls fortune, fortuna. That is to say, things that happen and of which we're not masters. For example the particular body I've been allotted or the fact that I'm poor or the fact that I'm sick or the fact that I don't know I, I uh, uh, some kind of uh, disgrace befalls me or you know uh, all these things fortuna fortune this poses a problem to us because we want to be independent we want to be masters of ourselves <coughs> Now, is there a way to be above fortune? Yes. Choosing your own death. That is to say, understanding yourself as a finite thing. And a finite thing that has been thrown into existence, into the domain of fortune. To which we are subjected in a way but knowing that you can always leave in that sense death and the meditation of death is the path to freedom that you say is the path whereby is the moment whereby you can exercise your will a sovereign will the moment in which you, you become fully master of yourself by saying I don't want the situation in which I am, hence I leave. Leave from what? From, from life itself. That is from the domain of fortune. That's the, the Stoics. And um, this take uh, of um, the reflection on death starts from the preoccupation of um, mastering life as the um, domain of our will. One can have another take on this, on the reflection on death. And I, uh, I um, want to bring uh, to the table here Montaigne, the, the, the French philosopher that I uh, uh, referred to before. Montaigne, when one reads Montaigne, one sees that Montaigne quotes Seneca every page, basically. But he quotes Seneca to say the opposite. What does Montaigne say? He says, well, very well, yeah, the meditation of death, but what is this meditation of death? He's realizing that I'm finite, that I die. Hence, should my problem be getting in command of myself because I can get out, because I can put an end to my life whenever I want? Perhaps no. In fact, he says, perhaps uh, the, the, the reasons why one ends his life might be very futile. And perhaps all reasons to put an end to your life are not only futile, but stupid. Stupid and crazy. So what, what is it that this uh, realization of our finitude should make me concentrate on? It should make me concentrate on fully living each moment that I am given. That's what I should concentrate on. That is to say, embracing my finitude means to uh, fully grasp each moment now. Because that moment 
is itself finite. It won't come back. And not only won't come back, it has never been there before. And I should do this, Montaigne says, casting away another silent but tyrannical ambition, that of perfection. In uh, an essay called... Um, wait, uh, the essay is... Um, uh, I think the essay is Que philosophe c'est apprendre à mourir. Uh, philosophy is to learn how to die. In that essay it says, um, I want us to act, to be active, to be involved with things. And uh, I want death to come get me as I'm planting my cabbages. And I want her, death, to find me nonchalant of death herself and nonchalant also of the imperfection of my garden. That is to say, the point is not doing something with the obsessive goal of reaching perfection, hence being under the anxiety that, oh, I can be taken away by death before I perfected what I'm doing, because you'll never perfect anything. And uh, that poisons your relation to things. You should just involve yourself in things, giving yourself fully to what you're doing and enjoying yourself as you're doing it. Before I said that language speaks through us, I think of the English expression, which I find very beautiful. I am enjoying myself, right? Enjoying yourself means that you're fully present to what you're doing and through what you're doing, you are present to yourself. If you drink a coffee, you know that you're drinking a coffee and you're enjoying its aroma, its uh, bitterness if you take it without sugar or its uh, contrast of sweet and bitter if, uh, as I do, you take it with sugar. Uh, I don't know, when you are reading a book, you are really there doing what you're doing, savoring the words and savoring yourself, savoring the words, okay? Enjoying yourself. In fact, Montaigne says in another essay, uh, Quand je dors, je dors. When I sleep, I sleep. That is to say, when I do that, I am all in that. Quand je danse, je danse. When I dance, I dance. And so on and so forth. Uh, so the reflection of death, on death in Montaigne becomes the reflection on our finitude and hence the reflection on the fact that we should be whole in doing what we do. We should be, as he says, homme entier, the whole men that we can be when we do what we do. One final thing about this. Uh, this expression, homme hom entier, the whole men, he uses again when he refers to real friendship. He says, when, when I'm really friend to someone, and I can be really friend only to one person, he says, friendship is not plural, he says, you, you can be totally friend only to one person, and that's because when you're totally friend to someone, you are totally whole, and you take the other person in its totality as well. Mm? When you are totally friend with someone, you are totally whole, homme entier, totally yourself, the full man. Uh, this expression, full man, l'homme entier, the, the, the whole man, he uses again when he talks about the enjoying of yourself in your involvement with things, which he calls experience, experience, right? What is then experience is being fully there in your wholeness as men, in your involvement with things, and in doing that you enjoy yourself. Now, given the fact that they use this expression also to talk about friendship, when you truly experience something, what is it that you're really experiencing? Yourself as friend to yourself. That is, you have to learn to become your friend. This seems something 
weird to think, but if you reflect on it, how many times are we actually friends to ourselves? How many times am I friend to myself? How many times that you say, I truly take care of myself? Not many times. In fact, the vast majority of times, here we go back to Seneca, we allow ourselves to be uh, torn apart, to be um, squandered by things that we do because they are imposed on us, we do because of boredom, we do because, as Montaigne says in another passage, we actually just spend time. That is to say, we don't live time, we spend it. In Italian we have this expression, killing time, I think you have it also in English. The, the, the thing is that, yeah, you can kill time, which means that you can just pass it without really living it, the truth is that time is going to kill you. <laughs> so, before it does, because it will, you may want to perhaps enjoy it. 